Push Cars, Mr. Beer here with another video, chapter 34, into the 1920s. We want to thank the band The Police with Every Breath You Take and another 1980 song, 1983. And that relates to this chapter because we're going to talk about our government um, watching every step we take. And so our government was coming after radicals right after World War One, and really relates to the first Red Scare, the fear of communists, but also socialists and anywhere left on the political spectrum. So in the 1920s, boys and girls, we went to the right. We went to the right uh, reactionary time period uh, in a push. All right, just a quick review about the political spectrum. To the left are the radicals, uh, and to the right are the reactionaries. Okay, And in America, the 1920s, politically, uh, we went to more reactionary time period, uh, and we, in America, got rid of many of the radical elements. Okay, So after World War I, America turned inward, we became very isolationist. The best example of that is the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations. The United States did not join the League of Nations despite creating it. So we were very isolationist, didn't care much about the rest of the world. In America, we're trying to take care of the communists. Now, I would highlight this, the first Red Scare uh, in United States history. So maybe you want to write down after the Red Scare, that was the time period in American history where the United States tried to rid itself of communists, and this happened after World War I. Related to the Red Scare, uh, an example evidence of the Red Scare are the Palmer Raids. I would highlight this event happened around 1919 uh, into 1920, and the Attorney General of the United States, Mitchell Palmer, he did round up 6,000 suspected communists. Many of them were sent to jail. Some were deported out of the country. And so the United States government went after communists to rid it of the radical element. Also, Sacco and Manzetti, you may remember these two guys from 10th grade history. They're Italian immigrants. They're accused of murdering um, somebody and his guards, so they're accused of murder. And they're Italians. They were atheists and anarchists, so they're very left on the political spectrum. They also were draft dodgers of World War I. A lot of Americans were not fond of this group of, per of people. So they were um, executed in 1927 for this accused murder. The evidence was very sketchy. Many people felt Sacco and Manzetti were innocent of the crime. But I would, many people argue that they were executed mostly because of they were, they were immigrants uh, and they were seen as more of radicals. So this is an example of the United States becoming uh, very reactionary during the 1920s. I got another reactionary group for you. The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, reached its peak membership in the 1920s. Highlight this. The 1920s was the golden age for the KKK. Um, and they continued the same tactics of fear and intimidation against uh, many minority groups. If you remember the KKK, when did it begin in a push? It began after the Civil War during Reconstruction in the South, and it reemerged during the 1920s. And so I would highlight this. The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, was more than just anti-black. They also were against Catholics, Jews, and immigrants, communists, or anybody against um, the war effort. Okay, so they had a lot of hate in them, and they were a terrorist group. Um, the Ku Klux Klan reemerged in the 1920s. I would highlight this film or book called *The Birth of the Nation* (1915). This film actually glorified the Ku Klux Klan, which today, in America, America, the Ku Klux Klan is a symbol of hatred and frowned upon. But back in 1915 and into the 1920s, this film and book actually glorified the KKK. In the later 1920s, the Klan actually did decrease rapidly in membership. They did carry over into the 1930s in the Great Depression. But the biggest reason why of their decline was because of embezzlement and fraud charges. Basically, it was a big pyramid scheme. Um, and eventually, um, the leaders of the Klan were arrested for this. So the Klan was not broken down because of the terrorists and the evil they did. It was a, it broken down because of the economic fraud that many of the Klan leaders uh, were a part of. Finally, here's a poster of The Birth of a Nation, this famous book and eventually movie that inspired uh, millions of people to join the Ku Klux Klan um, in the 19-teens and in the 1920s. All right, to me, this page is maybe the most important page of the entire video. It's talking about immigration, and I think this is a huge theme, a huge issue. This is about the peopling theme, and this section is stemming the foreign flood. So in 1920-21, 
8,000 new immigrants um, came to the United States. We talked about them in the past, and most of the new immigrants came from Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, Italy, Poland, Russia, and so on. And in response to this massive amount of new immigrants, the United States said no more, and so they passed two laws in the 1920s to limit immigration. The Emergency Quota Act of 1921, highlight like this, so the Quota Act of 1921 basically restricted immigration to 3% of their nationality living in the United States in 1910. So this was designed to limit immigration, and then three years later, an even more forceful Immigration Act, the Immigration Act of 1924, cut the quota down to 2%, and they pushed back the time period back to 1890. Well, what does this mean? Well, what this is basically saying is that the new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, there weren't many in America in 1890. So that is going to greatly decrease the number of immigrants coming to America after 1924 from Southeast Europe. This is definitely a nativist policy, and it affected the Southern and Eastern Europeans uh, coming to America. Or the question is, why, why, why? Why were so many Americans against them? Well, a lot of it had to do economics, had to do it with immigrants coming to take jobs. Also, America was, again, going towards the right on the political spectrum, becoming more reactionary and... I love political cartoons. I think this is a great political cartoon showing the nativism of the 1920s. Quick review. When else do we see nativism in America? Well, the 1850s, the what party? The what nothing party? The know nothing party was flourished in the 1850s against Irish and Germans. Again, we see it again in the 1880s, 1890s, the American Protective Association against all this wave of immigration. And then again in the 1920s, okay? Massive nativism uh, with these two laws. And 1921, 1924, and this one became even more restrictive. So all these Europeans wanted to come to America, but America funneled them with these new immigration laws, limiting the number of immigrants that actually came to the United States. All right, prohibition and temperance has been mentioned throughout APUSH, and it finally becomes the 18th Amendment uh, in 1919. This amendment uh, was passed. The law that's tied in with this amendment is the Volstead Act. Okay, so the amendment allowed it, the prohibition to happen, the actual law passed by Congress was the Volstead Act. It prohibited the use and sale of alcohol in the United States. And this is called, prohibition is called the noble experiment. So it was like, you know, it's a good idea. Let's try it. Let's try to end prohibition. A lot of problems with alcoholism, um, violence, abuse, so on. So let's try to make this noble experiment happen. Um, however, it did not work. Prohibition did not work. Now, people maybe drank a little bit less, but people still did drink alcohol overall. The law was not enforced very well um, by the federal government. And one of the biggest negatives of the noble experiment prohibition is organized crime flourish, another terrible thing. So in the end, prohibition was repealed in 1933, 19 years later with the 21st Amendment. So it did not work. All right, the golden age of gangsterism is tied into prohibition. Organized crime hike this flourish in the 1920s because of prohibition. A little bit of causation there. Organized crime were able to sell the illegal alcohol, uh, the moonshine, and they became bootleggers. That was the name for the organized crime, selling illegal alcohol. Chicago uh, is where it happened the worst. Um, organized crime were the most uh, famous gangs were created. One of the worst events related to organized crime in Chicago was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. Uh, Infamous gang leader Al Capone ordered the killing of several rival gang members, so it's a black eye um, for prohibition, the rise of organized crime. Al Capone never went to jail for his killing of people and his um, bootlegging and all of his corrupt practices, but he did go to jail, though, finally on tax evasion for failing to pay his income taxes, so that's how the, the infamous, awful Al Capone was able to get to jail. Also, gangs... Um, involved in organized crime and bootlegging spread out into other um, awful areas, uh, prostitution, gambling, and drugs as well. So prohibition caused this uh, bad time in a American history. Hey, let's talk about some monkey business in Tennessee. The Scopes trial in 1925 highlight this, probably the biggest trial in 1920s besides Sacco and Vanzetti. Those are the two biggest trials and this whole trial dealt with a, the teaching of evolution in public schools by a name named John Scopes. Frankly, you don't need to know him. The last name is important, but this is the Scopes trial. He was a science teacher in Tennessee, uh, again, a more reactionary conservative area. And he was charged with teaching evolution in public schools that was against the law. Well, 
William Jennings Bryan actually is going to represent not Scopes, but actually the school district. So William Jennings Bryan was for fundamentalist beliefs, for religion. He's going to represent them in this trial. Clarence Darrow is more of a modernist. He defends Scopes in this trial. He is one of the most famous lawyers um, in American history, and he defends the teacher, John Scopes. Here's a picture of uh, Darrow in WJB. He's still around. Unfortunately for him, he dies shortly after this trial, but he's still fighting, and he just can't win. All right, some more specifics of the Scopes Monkey Trial. Again, it was about the teaching of evolution in public schools. Teacher John Scopes broke the law, and so there was this trial to see if he should uh, go to jail for this. All right, so this came down to really the two lawyers. Clarence Darrow, who represented the teacher, Scopes, made WJB look foolish. Okay, WJ was supposed to be a fundamentalist and expert on the Bible, and it was difficult for WJB to answer some of the biblical questions that are kind of difficult to believe, such as Jonah being swallowed by the whale. What's important is the result of this. Well, John Scopes was found guilty of teaching evolution, um, and the law was not changed in the South. However, Scopes never had to pay the fine, and basically he got let off with, with, with just basically a slap on the wrist. But here's the biggest issue that this um, event represents. There was a big conflict in the 1920s between religion versus science, or between fundamentalism beliefs, uh, again, more right on the, on the spectrum, in modernism, who are willing more for change, uh, more left on the spectrum. So religion versus science in the United States in the 1920s was becoming a more modern society, despite many people not wanting to go in that direction. All right, this political cartoon does a good job showing the conflict of the 1920s. And the conflict was between, in this political cartoon, they're looking at communism versus religion. So Bolsheviks, whenever you see that term, that's referring to the Russian communists. They were evil people. They supported the communist revolution, overthrowing the Tsar. And communists believe in no God. Okay, But they believe, communism believes in the proletariat or the working class, workers in the factories, Okay, the lower class society. They're the ones that are the most important in a society. So this, communism is against uh, organized religion and fundamentalism. And so is science, according to this cartoon saying science falsely so called and there's no god but protoplasm so that's a scientific term so it shows the conflict in the 1920s between the, these two beliefs um, and that was one of the big issues change versus um, the way things used to be in the 1920s all right the final slide is the mass consumption economy the economy absolutely boomed in the 1920s that's partially why they called the 20s the roaring 20s one of the greatest economic booms in American history, along with probably the 1950s uh, into the 60s, great economic boom, the 1990s as well, and the 20s was one of the greatest booms in economic history. Henry Ford from Michigan, one of the great uh, leaders in Michigan, he did perfect the assembly line and mass production of the automobile. More and more Americans were able to buy cars because of, of his production of the assembly line. I would highlight this as well besides Henry Ford. Uh, Bruce Barton um, wrote a book called The Man Nobody Knows, and he claimed that Jesus uh, was the perfect salesperson um, and basically that all advertisers should study his methods. It's kind of weird to think about, but basically he showed the importance of advertising to get people to do things, in this case, getting people to spend money on these new uh, consumer goods. Some of the new buying techniques were installment plan buying and credit. People went into debt. Maybe I want to write this down. People went into debt to buy a lot of these new products. We're talking about the radio, um, um, the refrigerator, uh, some of these newer inventions that people wanted to have in the automobile. Also, because people have more leisure time, sports becomes a spectator sport, and the greatest sports hero of the 1920s was Babe Ruth, um, and he made baseball the national pastime.